medical conditions. We always have to think about it this way. When you're diagnosing a psychiatric condition, any type of psychiatric condition, you have to think about any other causes that are not only emotional causes. Because you don't want to look over a thyroid problem, which is very common in anxiety disorder or depression. You don't want to look over a seizure disorder, which you will see is very common in bipolar disorder. Not common in bipolar disorder. It, pre it presents commonly as bipolar disorder. And it's not bipolar disorder, it's a seizure disorder. Yes? To that extent, when you're starting to diagnose that disease, I'm sorry. I can't. To that extent, on the seizure disorder, do you just go in and certain brain scans to be able to roll out seizures versus the bipolar? Disorder? Well, the the problem with the seizure, well, there are certain things that occur in seizure disorder that do not occur in bipolar disorder. Um, for example, and this is not on the slide, so we'll go ahead and talk about this. In bipolar disorder, you usually do not get olfactory, which is olfactory hallucinations, things that smell bad. You usually do not get tactile hallucinations, feeling things crawling on your skin. Those are indicators of physical conditions. Okay. I just said something that I'm completely against. Em psychiatric disorders are physical conditions also. They're medical problems, right? But we're talking more about an anatomical problem then, okay. which is also, as we can tell, is not all true either, because all psychiatric conditions are also known to anatomy. We're just starting with that. Okay, so medical conditions, thyroid problems, right? um, immunocompromised kids, frequent problems with um, like uh, um, arthritis, right? kids that have mononucleosis get depressed. It's really interesting. Um, kids that get uh, recurrent. Um, recurrent strep throat, more associated to anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder, but there can also be emotional differences. In smaller children, who has not seen a fussy child, right? A colicky child, right? They have stomach problems. Constipation can make a child really upset for a long period of time and they look depressed and it's constipation. That was actually one of, my, one of the cases that I saw when I was a resident. The kiddo was diagnosed as a mood disorder. But every, he was my therapy patient, and every time that he would have an anger outburst, I saw that he would get kind of red and start breaking a sweat and just look really bad. Well, he had horrendous constipation, like week and a half, two weeks of not even going to the bathroom. And so when, every time he had, and he had a very poor, he had an expressive language disorder, so he couldn't express what he was feeling. And it wasn't bipolar. It was not a mood disorder. It was taken care of the way you take care of constipation, and his mood got better. So physical, medical problems, as in, in, in things that affect your, your, your GI tract, um, headaches, migraines, can make kids look like they're depressed. Yes? What correlations are you finding between food sensitivity? That's a good question. Uh, I think that what correlation, my answer to that is allergies change people's moods. And in San Antonio, you definitely see that. You see the kiddo that you're treating for anxiety or irritability, depression, and then they come into the office and they are not breathing. Well, if they're not breathing, they're not sleeping. They feel miserable. And they get sad, they get depressed, they're not going to pay attention, their concentration is down, they start moving really slow. So, so there is a correlation to me with allergies. So if there are food allergies, um, things like, uh, which is I think what, what people look more to, you know, this food causes this kind of thing. Do you ask them to journal to see you know, what kind of results you have in the child that's spread or you know, bread or whatever? You know, I wish... I should say yes to that, but honestly, uh, again, I should say yes to that. <laughs> honestly, yes, we should do that. Do I do it all the time? No. Oh, exactly. Oh, horrible. Well, and, and then uh, remember that 
kids with autism can get depressed. And they're very, very sensitive to any change and feelings that are different in their body. So you have the kiddo with Asperger's that comes in that looks like they you know, have major depressive disorder, fit all the criteria, and they had recurrent ear, infec ear infections. Actually, that otitis media is very common. At least I see that in the office as something as a differential diagnosis for, for irritability. Yes. I know it's clear with like the face we get, but with headaches and stomach aches, how do you figure out what came first? Is the depression causing the headache or is the headache causing the depression? Very difficult sometimes. Very difficult because in in those cases um, you try to you get them the treatment for the headaches, right? If and and migraines in kids is not always easy to treat. I think it's easier to treat in adults because the adult is able to do something about it. Right. And the, the adolescent, not always. So if, of course, you treat it and then the mood gets better, then you can make that association. One came before the other. But it's not always possible. Yes. Yes, can you uh, please repeat the question? Because we can't hear back here. Oh, I'm sorry. If the, the question is, oh, OK. Oh, my gosh. I, I have a memory problem. <laughs> I don't remember all the questions, but we'll try. We'll do that again. We'll do the yes. yes. What about kids that are born from uh, substance abusing moms and moms that drink? Are they kids in foster care, adopted kids that are heavy that have to go through methadone withdrawal? Or are those kids more susceptible to depression? To depression? Well, when you think about it, all those trends. It depends on the age, but yes, because. Uh, one of the major causes of depression in infants, we're not even talking about children, in infants is maternal depression. So are they affected by parents that are depressed? Sure. And then you treat, and you, you've heard, I don't know if you've heard of the study, but basically there's some studies that show in infant depression, you treat the mother's depression, you do not treat the infant depression, and then the infant is no longer depressed. So that's how it, it's very, very important to always check the milieu, always. And when you have kids that are in foster care, the milieu is very unstable. And you lack tons of information also. Oh, and there it is, maternal, paternal depression. So we just mentioned that one. Uh, other psychiatric conditions. The uh, differentia uh, for example, children, children, not adolescents, that are anxious, might look depressed. They don't really know what anxiety even is. They can't describe anxiety as worrying about bad things happening, basically. But what's anxiety provoking for us is not anxiety provoking for kids. And our anxiety is more, we can describe, you know, a fear of something bad happening and I can't tolerate this. Little kids can't do that. So they can look kind of depressed. They can look sad. And it's not sadness. Once you look into it, it's more like, I'm scared of this happening, right? I'm scared of being away from my parents. And they look irritable as opposed to fearful. And the may, one of the things that we have to watch out for, this is very, very important in children, is the earlier the onset of depressive episodes, the more it points towards bipolar disorder. Usually, individuals come into the office and are diagnosed with depression first when they're bipolar, eventually when they're eventually diagnosed with bipolar disorder, their first diagnosis is depressive disorder or major depressive disorder. The implications of that treatment-wise is that you could easily fall into trying to treat this person with an antidepressant, and then you make them manic because they were always bipolar disorder, right? And we will see when we go into the bipolar disorder that manic in children does not mean happy, elated, and God is talking to you, it can mean I'm extremely angry, I want to kill everyone. Okay, And that could be what we call the mixed episodes. So the antidepressant can induce irritability, can affect sleep, and that points more towards bipolar disorder. But this is the trick there. It doesn't mean they're bipolar. Because you can have activation from antidepressant without having the, the presentation of bipolar. Is that kind of complicated or what? <laughs>
Okay, clinical course. We're going to kind of, because we're not going to have enough time to talk about bipolar. Um, duration, usually eight months. When you look at a clinical, a clinic sample, the duration of, of, of a depressive episode, major depressive disorder, without treatment is eight months. Right? And in a community sample, when you look for it, it's about one to two months. And then, boop, it's disappeared. Why is this? We're not too sure. Okay. Well, it probably because the ones that come into the clinic are more severe cases. Because remember, all this is a spectrum. There's just not one form and severity of major depressive disorder. Probability of recurrence, very important for treatment. 20 to 60%, one to two years after their remission, recur. And then 70% recurrence after five years. So if you have not had any depressive episodes in five years, it's a 70% probability that you will get, again, another depressive episode. Right? Hopefully, your treatment has included psychoeducation so that the person can say, wow, it's been a long time, but I'm starting to feel what I felt before, which is this, this, and this, and this. I need to go in and get help. And they do when it's still at a mild uh, level and not when it's severe, like when they were adolescents and they came in. Um, development of bipolar disorder. In early onset depression, 20 to 40% of these individuals end up having bipolar disorder. That's a big number. In early onset, so before the age of 10. Genetics. Yes, there is genetics involved in everything in mental health. Okay. If you have, this is why you have to ask for family history. So, 76, monozygotic twins are the ones that are identical twins, have the same genetic load. Okay. Those are the ones that are used for these studies. Because if there's a high correlation of these illnesses um, in the identical twins but not in the fraternal twins as much, then you know that there is a high genetic load to it. And there is, as you can see. Um, and again, when you examine, the higher the genetic load, the earlier the age of onset. And actually the other way around. The earlier the age of onset you examine, and there's a higher genetic load. So there's more aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents that have the condition. Environmental, without going into detail about uh, neurotransmitters, brain anatomy, we're seeing that a lot of these things are changed in depression. They're also changed in ADHD, right? Now when they get functional MRIs and research, different parts of the brain um, light up. So the brain is physically affected. The neurotransmitters are physically affected. Gluso, uh, glucose, like the metabolism of certain parts of the brain, are changed in depression in every single thing. In you know, depression, ADHD, bipolar disorder, all of them. So what makes these things light up? Genetics, also the changes because of external stressors. So dysfunctional family, right? But dysfunctional families also have individuals that have had issues with bipolar disorder, anxiety, so they have their genetic load apart from just the dysfunction. Right? Abuse. When we look at PTSD, high comorbidity with depression. Parental depression, we already talked about that, affects the interaction. It's very different when you grow up feeling loved and your needs are satisfied than when you grow up without that. And your coping skills are not as good, you're not as resilient, and then you have a higher risk of being depressed. Losses, of course, grieving. Um, and losses don't mean that people die. Losses mean your mom has got, is put in prison for 10 years and you don't get to see her again. Or your little brother was abused and your whole family was taken away and that the favorite, which was never treated in a bad way, doesn't understand why that even happened. Right? Divorce. There's another one. Uh, and comorbidity is a risk factor. If there's anxiety, ADHD, it raises the uh, possibility of having depression. The risk of. So assessment, and just to fly through this, assessment, you have to establish a good relationship with the, with the patient as well as with the parent. But with the patient, what you really want to do is understand their vocabulary and start teaching them vocabulary so you can clarify things. The parent thinks that they have a good vocabulary because they're adults, but they don't necessarily have mental health vocabulary. And if they haven't had good communica communication with the child, they don't even know what words the child uses. Right? And the child doesn't know what you, words the parent uses. 
uh, and external sources, we have anything, school, the teachers, the principal, the coach, um, the therapists, the school counselors. And we definitely need to screen for suicide in any individual that is depressed, whether it's mild depression or whether we don't even know if they're depressed or not. Suicide is something that safety concerns or something we have to um, screen for. Environmental stressors, we have to screen for support systems. If you don't have a support system, how are you going to get to the appointments in the first place? Just because your grandparent took it one time doesn't mean you're going to be able to make it in every single time for medication changes, for your therapy sessions, and also, again, family psychiatric history. OK, we have acute continuation and maintenance phase. The acute is when the person is just starting to get depressed. They're in kind of their, not even starting, but they're in their episode of depression. Okay? You start treating them at that point. Then the continuation is you continue the treatment to avoid that the depression comes back. And then you have maintenance treatment, which actually avoids or decreases the reoccurrence, which means you're doing great, and we're going to try to avoid that depression, which is going to come back at a 70% rate after five years. We're going to try to avoid that one completely. It's called a maintenance. It doesn't mean you have to be in treatment for five years. It means that there is a six months to 12 months recommendation of treatment after you're doing great that you should continue to make those numbers go down, the risk factors, go, not the risk factors, the, the recurrence factor uh, risk going down. Okay? In other words, the bottom line is even though you're feeling great, the individual should not stop medication for six to 12 months. And some, I'm, I'm very conservative in that, so I say 12 months. Because 12 months is only six months difference, and it can make a lot of difference in your life if you do have another episode. OK, some docs only do six months. Yes, you talk a lot about the reoccurring statistics. Does that mean that you were talking about the 20 to 40% um, uh, will develop bipolar as adults? Are you saying then that the 60 to 80% will outgrow it? Or if they receive proper treatment during their adolescence, that they will not? Good question. Because that's one of the one of the issues when we go into bipolar, that's one of the issues that necessary that bipolar disorder in juveniles is not necessarily the same as bipolar and disorder in adults. So some of the studies that are coming out are showing that the bipolar disorder that is very clear in adolescence continues through adulthood. Some kids that are diagnosed with bipolar disorder right, or mood disorder NRS do not have bipolar disorder as adults. The theory is it was never the same bipolar in the first place. And they're trying to come up with another name called emotional dysregulation syndrome, or that's for the DSM-5, because they're finding that there is no continuity. So the answer to your question is, I don't know. I don't know if the kid that has bipolar disorder today is necessarily going to have it later on. I know that they, if they have bipolar disorder one with a clear manic episode, with the adult criteria, very likely they will continue having bipolar disorder their whole life and they will have to be treated for it. But when we see the other kiddos, I'm not sure. And, you know, and, and the older they get and the older I get and see more cases, the more I'm seeing that that's not necessarily the case, that a lot of these kiddos that I never had I just never, they never fit the criteria for bipolar disorder. They just are diagnosed with mood disorder. They kind of outgrew it, and they're functioning, and they're down to, you know, treating depression and anxiety only. So was it even bipolar in the first place? So I feel very comfortable now just being mood disorder NOS and saying, I'm not completely sure. <laughs>